Panman14 here, bringing you a new series. As you know, I am working on Mario Kart PC Flash. Obviously, I'm working on music, but I'm also working with Mario Knows 1 on track layout. Mario Knows 1 track analysis series focuses more on the retro stages that will appear, while my track design series is designed to be a complement, but focusing on original courses that will appear in the game as well. I'm going to try my best to put as much depth as I can into each track that I do. But because these are original tracks, I'm going to need a little help from both you guys and the development team. So feel free to post your ideas down below in the comment section. This idea for Piranha Pipeworks is very simple, but it can get complicated if you can't follow along. So I'll explain this as best as I can. The concept of Piranha Pipeworks is based off a of star topology for use of a hub. For those that may not know exactly what this terminology is, it's basically how a ginormous company, like Nintendo for example, connect to the internet at the same exact time. A single computer connects to a focal point that is able to send data or a signal, which is, in our case, called a hub. This hub is also used to send information between individual computers, for example, sending a file from computer 4 to computer 3. You are racing inside of a Mario World equivalent of a hub, hypothetically speaking, where all the worlds and or piranhas connect and means of traveling to other worlds throughout the Mario series. Through the use of traditional warp pipes and the anti-gravity mechanic, Players will race on four of the six sides of a hub. You can also think of this as racing inside of a rectangular prism, or a cube, using anti-gravity. Just so we all can keep up, I'll be using these terms that you see here to further explain the track layout. But first, let's start with the atmosphere. The area surrounding the track is very similar to the pipe stage from New Super Mario Bros. multiplayer mode as pipes are everywhere, twisting and turning in many directions. Instead of having the stone background like you see here, we will have the traditional underground block from the first Mario Bros. To make this seem more like a hub, or an interconnecting focal point, I was thinking that we could have markings on many of the pipes that have the names of many worlds seen throughout the Mario series. Even some odd ones like maps from Paper Mario or Mario & Luigi franchise. For worlds that do not have direct names, we can use a unique coding system. This will give the more knowledgeable players something to think about. The long number in the brackets is not a made-up number. It is actually the Japanese release date of the first real Super Mario Bros. on NES. It's even in proper date format, with the day first, month second, and year last. If this marking was placed on one of the pipes in this course, the more knowledgeable players, or die-hard fans, will recognize that that particular pipe is connected to the first underwater stage in Super Mario Bros. Excusing my... drawings... <laughs> this is the overview for the track layout. For some key details, the dark shaded areas covering the track at some points are warp pipes, as talked about before. Each warp pipe takes you to a different side of the prism. I'll get into more details about each section later on in this video. This three-lane section is actually a road texture change. Here, the player is racing on three tricolor pipes that cross into different directions. Each pathway was carefully crafted to ensure fairness so players can't rely too heavily on a single path. You may have noticed the X on the left path here. I'll cover that more later. You also may have noticed as stated, that these two are the same exact warp pipes. Again, I'll cover more on this later. This is just the overview. This is the base, or bottom, of the prism, which is where the players will start. Everything else around the center square you see here is nothing but notes I use to finish the track layout. I would like to draw your attention to the top half of this picture, and you'll see how I would want the sign to be structured. Pipe 1 on the left side of the sign comes straight out of the wall, cradling the Mario Kart sign, while Pipe 2 does the same but is curving downward into the base. The lines you see underneath both pipes here 
can either be small tiny pipes stabilizing the two larger pipes, or whatever is decided upon to help capture the concept of this track. But I must point out that these poles are not holding up the sign, they are holding up the pipes. The Mario Kart sign itself can be seen on the right side of the overall picture. It's meant to be very metallic. Now for the track itself. The texture of the road starting off is similar to galvanized iron. Making the first turn, we come to a crisscross. The small boxes you see on the track is more or less where the first set of item boxes will be. This thing in the center before the path reconnects is actually a panoramic piranha as seen from Mario Kart 7 Piranha Plant Slide. After the paths reconnect for good, the players hit their first anti-gravity strip, which takes us to our first warp pipe. You come out through the warp pipe at the bottom of this picture. Pretty basic stuff happening here, but there are a few things I want to note. Remember those fire piranha plants from Mario 3D Land? A giant one is sitting right here off the track, but the key is that this guy is not harming anybody on this section of the map. He's not chomping at anybody, he's not blowing fire or anything. But be sure to remember this guy, he is very important. This part here is similar to the Mario Kart 8 Mario Circuit track, as you have a normal piranha on an off-road. It can also serve as a shortcut to those that have a mushroom. From here, you take a large jump, still in anti-gravity by the way, past this empty pipe. This pipe is very important as well. You land on a new road texture that is the tricolor pipes that I was talking about before. You also gain your second set of item boxes and the next warp pipe you go into. Now we are on the left side of the prism. The players now have a choice between three paths. I'll rotate the picture so we can talk about the pathways taken. I'll also talk about how exactly each path is different but equal and provide both a advantage and disadvantage. This isn't drawn properly, but the pathways after reconnecting, the pipes are actually elevated in height until you get to the warp pipe. We'll start with the left path. Remember that X from the overall layout? That X is actually a sweeping purplish piranha, as seen from Super Mario 3D World. It acts like a bouncing mushroom, for example, Wii Mushroom Gorge. When bounced upon by a player, it will change colors to show that it is awake, like the actual game. This pathway after reconnecting is elevated the highest. The advantage of taking this path results in a short boost, but the disadvantage of this path is the momentum of the boost after landing. Only a good handler can properly take that turn without falling off to the midway elevated pipe due to how small the turn radius is. Physics reminds us that the smaller turn radius is the fastest way to take the turn. The center pipe is the most average. When taken straight through, the end result won't put a player too far ahead or behind, because after the pipes reconnect, this pipe is midway elevated. You'll notice a small ramp guarded by an off-road texture. When this ramp is taken, with a mushroom obviously, they are able to cross paths onto the right path. But now the players are left with the same disadvantage as the right path. The right path is fairly certain to put you in the lead at the beginning of the split because of how linear it is compared to the other paths, and because it is the only path out of the three that has a boost pad, which is located underneath the left path. Unfortunately, it is the lowest elevated path, which means after reconnecting with the other pipes, the players are forced to take that wide turning radius since the mid-elevated pipe is blocking them from changing lanes. The three pipes re-elevate just before going into the next warp pipe to the last section of the track, and the most interesting. This final section takes place on the frontal part of the prism. After coming out of this warp pipe, the players jump back onto either the first texture or a third new texture that is completely straight. We now take a look back at the ceiling section. Remember how I said that the fire piranha from before wasn't doing anything to the racers on that section? That's because it is firing fireballs at the straightaway section on the frontal section. Think about Double Gash's Bowser's Castle to the Bowser statue firing fireballs straight at you. This fire piranha plant is doing the same exact thing, but firing at target spots on the road 
since the player isn't directly facing the piranha plant like Bowser Castle. As you can also see, players can take a ramp on either side of the track. This was just something I put in to make the section a little less bland. For those that have noticed, each warp pipe seen in the previous layouts have been labeled a number to tell what pipe you go through and what pipe you come out of. But this one ends with a jump and a bubble that says 27. The reason why you can't see it here is because it was already drawn on the ceiling layout from before. This warp pipe that was jumped over before is pipe number 7 and the final warp pipe that takes you back to the start, thus completing a lap. A anti-gravity strip is here at the end as well. Ah, <sighs> finally done with that. Long story short, you're racing inside of a giant rectangular prism, or a cube, that represents a huge network of pipes being used throughout the Mario franchise as a whole. You start off on the base, use anti-gravity and warp pipes to race on the ceiling, left side of the prism, and finally the frontal part of the prism, that jumps into the same warp pipe you jumped over from the ceiling to take you back to the base. I'm very interested in hearing what you guys have to say about this in the comments. I plan to do a lot more of these for the future. Lastly, let me know if I am articulating properly in my voice. I do have an underbite which is creating a lisp that you can probably hear. So, do you prefer if I write out what I'm thinking or speak what I'm trying to say? I personally prefer to speak, but if it's not getting a point across, I, I'll do what I can. Thanks!